Kia ora everybody. Um, uh, I'm Emeline Pat Dahlstrom and this is Eric. And uh, we're from Space Base. Um, so really uh, sorry that uh, we're not able to be in Wellington today because of the lockdown, but also it gave uh, an opportunity for others who are in different regions to actually join us um, this uh, this afternoon or this evening. So that that's uh, actually great. So in terms of the agenda for today, um, for the one hour, uh, we're actually doing a briefing for the Space Challenge, so all about the project, uh, the the uh, the problem areas, the tech, the tools, um, and then also we have a special guest uh, as well um, talking at the end of the the, the, the briefing. So. Maybe just to kind of um, start the ball rolling, I will share screen. Let me go here, right. So yeah, just to start the, the session here is like, uh, I want to kind of like point out uh, why we're sort of like doing the challenge. And, uh, you know, today we're all, uh, the whole world is kind of like focused on COVID and the pandemic, but really climate change uh, and, and its impact is still really on the rise and um, is, is really felt kind of like all around the world. Uh, as you can imagine, all of the increase in national natural disasters with record temperatures and drought and like super typhoons that are happening uh, this year is, is all attributed to this. And, and actually, the later the latest like IPCC report validates what we already know, uh, which is that climate change um, and global warming uh, is is human induced. So really, the biggest challenge for us today is to reduce greenhouse gases. And New Zealand is fully committed to carbon zero by 2050, but we're also running out of time. So I guess for space based. We really think that researchers and the academic community, specifically students, uh, can play a much bigger role um, for you know, accelerating the uh, CO2 reductions through research um, and also through innovation. So the good news here though, is that also uh, the technology has been exponentially developing. And so therefore, you know, with technology, we have smaller, cheaper, faster, um, and it has democratized the access to space technologies today, which is like not the same as like 10 years ago. So uh, today you can actually make a difference um, with uh, the, the information that, that we have today, you know, data is free, especially for researchers and, and academia coming from um, government owned uh, satellites. Although in this particular challenge, we are also going to leverage some commercial satellite data as well. Uh, and then also uh, in the past, these analytical tools are also very expensive, but today you've got, um, you know, platforms like QGIS that are open source that can be leveraged. And so for anybody, uh, really, uh, you only need a Wi-Fi and a personal computer to actually be part um, of, of this, uh, this potential movement of, of helping us uh, with, um, with reducing climate change. And what we really want is actionable information. So not just monitoring, but really something that uh, we can actually leverage to reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, and, uh, and reduce it. So uh, our ask for you today really is, uh, is to invite you to create teams uh, and to define an approach uh, and we'll talk about the, the problem areas and then uh, apply to join the incubation uh, research program that uh, we will be um, delivering around November to, to January timeframe. So I'm going to uh, turn you over to Eric to talk more about the motivations of the actual like problem areas uh, that we're dealing with. Hi, yes. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of background and reminders about the climate change and the motivation for the problem areas we are picking. And, the, and then I'll get into more of the, the two problem areas that are in this challenge, uh, which are carbon sequestration and coral health. And then Emily will go on and, and uh, talk about uh, the details of the process of applying this. So uh, back to the basics of climate change. Um, this is a overview chart uh, showing the, um, uh, that has the, the solar, the energy balance in, uh, across the spectrum here with a, um, uh, the solar energy coming down in the visible light mainly, and then 
uh, uh, over here in the infrared is where the heat from the earth is re-radiated back into space. And so you have to have this, this energy balance. And the, the problem that, uh, uh, that's been going on is that um, we've been increasing the level of CO2 and these other greenhouse gases, and, which are blocking more of the infrared radiation from uh, back from the earth. And the earth heats up until, until there's an equal amount of energy going back out into space. Uh, so it's the temperature is actually rising in order to, uh, to get this energy balance. Um, oh, let's see. Okay, here we are. So, so basically, after uh, th tens of thousands of studies and uh, analysis and lots of satellite and uh, observations, the basic uh, conclusion from this latest IPCC report is that there's a overall across the Earth there's a increase of 2.72 watts per every square meter. That's uh, more energy coming in from that's uh, being uh, trapped in the Earth system because of this, uh, these greenhouse gases. And you know, just about three watts per square meter doesn't seem like a lot, but if you spread it out over the entire um, surface of the earth, it adds up to a huge amount of energy. If you measure that in, in uh, atomic uh, uh, explosive power units, of, uh, it's equal to 330 kilotons of explosive power per second. So it's basically, like 20 Hiroshima bombs going off each second is the amount of energy that's being added into the Earth's environment. And that's where you get all the warming of the oceans and the land and the atmosphere and the cyclones and driving the, uh, the weather systems and things like that. All this extra energy is going there. So uh, this then the problem is caused just by this in steadily increasing uh, levels of, of greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide. So we have these projections in the latest IPCC report of all these different scenarios in the future, like if you continue on business as usual, or uh, you end up with huge amounts of carbon dioxide and huge warming of the planet. And so the Paris Agreement and all these other agreements are trying to bend the curve uh, and reduce the carbon dioxide emissions and then the, the last ones that you're really aiming for maintaining the temperature of the earth uh, to not increase that much, they depend on uh, uh, are a lot of carbon sequestration, a lot of cap removing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in biomass, et cetera. And so that's uh, a motivation for, for where our problem uh, statement is, which is looking at the uh, how you capture more uh, uh, carbon out of the atmosphere, remove from the atmosphere and store it in, in biomass. Uh, this is a, from rough numbers of the, um, uh, there's that 40 billion tons, 40 gigatons, which are billions of tons of carbon dioxide uh, emitted each year. And in a overall sinks uh, removed from the atmosphere of or about half of that, um, and the each country is uh, trying to assess how much is is being emitted by by the countries and how much is being absorbed. And the uh, New Zealand has make a big effort to try to document how much uh, carbon dioxide it thinks it's being removed by the by the plants uh, in New Zealand. Um, Australia is very uncertain. It's uh, twenty megaton million tons uh, removed by uh, uh, in the coastal areas. Um, and there's a potential for hundreds of millions of tons uh, to be removed on land, but it's very uncertain. And, uh, and also the Pacific Islands is, is very uncertain. And so uh, in the future, these numbers are gonna be very important for reaching these targets and also potentially very viable on a international training scheme. So in the, of the different types of, of uh, carbon sequestration, uh, you have, um, let's see, uh, we have uh, these land and coastal zones from uh, forest and native bush and pasture and wetlands 
Uh, and then you have uh, what's called blue carbon in the mangrove, salt marshes, and seagrass. And then there's the open ocean. And so uh, a lot of these numbers are very uncertain, um, and especially on, on the pasture number is very uh, highly uncertain. And so that's part of the target is of this challenge is to try to understand better uh, what these values are and be able to document them from, from uh, using satellite data. Because right now, uh, for example, New, Ze New Zealand has a uh, has this, this scheme for emissions trading scheme where it gives credits for uh, growing forests. And there's some, sometimes you can get credits for a native bush uh, and the going rate is about $36 per ton of CO2 capture. And so, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's something where it works for uh, standardized, you know, exotic uh, for us, but uh, doesn't work necessarily for all these other areas that are, uh, have a potential benefit. And you can really, uh, if you can give an incentive to landowners for, preserving wetlands or pastures and things like that, that that would be a big uh, improvement over the current situation. So uh, in New Zealand, there's uh, the, the standardized report uh, approach is to uh, require a lot of uh, on-site uh, verification of, or and measurement of trees uh, physically going out in the, into specific locations. Um, there's uh, other companies that are starting to apply satellite remote sensing to uh, give uh, to identify credits for blocks of forest, and uh, uh, and then uh, so there's but it, it's still trying to fit within the current system, and and if what we we think there's opportunities for uh, generalizing this these uh, for other uh, land types or, or marine areas. So this, is, this comes down to the, our problem statement, which is um, using satellite data in combination with other data sources, help develop verifiable methods to improve or to measure carbon sequestration on land or in coastal areas. And so the idea is that you want to uh, come up with a, uh, an approach that would uh, address at least some part of this and, and advance the uh, uh, the areas uh, in, for example, in these different uh, land and coastal areas, or uh, and the and the, you have a not only uh, the the planet data from our partnership, but you also have all these other uh, free, free data, data free data sources that are uh, provided by uh, the U.S. government or the European government. Uh, and just to give you an illustration of some of these uh, different data sources, uh, New Zealand currently in their land use maps applies, you know, Sentinel-2 uh, multispectral data to categorize different kinds of land cover. Uh, and they also uh, do ground truth on, on specific sites and uh, collect that data for these uh, reports across the country. Uh, with what we're offering in this challenge also is access, access to uh, planet images, which are uh, uh, daily uh, revisits of in the visible light and near infrared and with about five meter resolution. And then, uh, but there's, we're also suggesting that you may find useful information in other bands in the spectral, in the multi-spectral data in Sentinel or, Lan or Landsat to give you better ideas about what kinds of plants uh, or native bush or things like that. And, and then there are other uh, possible approaches of using uh, LIDAR lasers uh, with either airborne or, or ISAT-2. And uh, then there's microwaves that detect uh, properties of the, uh, just in the bare, in the subsurface or the different aspects of the radar data that can penetrate a little bit farther because there's a, a lot of carbon that's being sequestered in the root systems also. And so with, with uh, for this challenge and this partnership, we have access to the Planet platform uh, with a uh, specific research license uh, and uh, uh, 5,000 square kilometers per month of data 
uh, from their uh, current plant scope and, and uh, rapid eye archives, and also training and support. And this is just an example of, of some of the planet data being used right now for, for this company in New Zealand that monitors for us. That, uh, for example, they, they're able to see that this area has uh, winds knock down some of the trees just because planet monitors every day. And then they, this is a higher uh, example of the higher resolution version. So that was all the carbon sequestration problem. Now, the other problem that were uh, in, included in this challenge is the uh, coral health. Uh, help improve the monitoring of coral health changes due to climate change using satellite technology. And for this, uh, this is uh, the main resource is this Allen Coral Atlas, which uses planet data, but is uh, has been analyzed and maps uh, different categories of, of uh, coral and uh, geomorphic uh, information. And so you have uh, a big issue is trying to identify um, live coral and dead coral because the, the dead coral is, the coral can be threatened both by uh, warming oceans and also oceans acidification due to climate, uh, to the carbon dioxide. Uh, and uh, then also coral can be under stress from a number of other areas, uh, overfishing uh, or from pollution or uh, even runoff from the from the rivers, and so uh, the coral data, uh, the Allen Coral Atlas. We have a video coming up that gives an overview, but it's really an extensive database of the status of corals with at least three layers of of uh, different years, and it's possible also to apply some of the new planet data for, to the same issue. Uh, one of the peculiar challenge for coral is that um, healthy coral actually has these um, animal microorganisms that have um, algae trapped in a symbiotic way inside the coral. And then uh, when, it's, when it's killed in by one of these by uh, uh, heating or uh, acidification event, uh, it can be bleached and the algae um, uh, gets out of the uh, dead coral. And then uh, turning around, the algae grows on top of the dead coral. And so the Allen Coral Atlas has a real challenge with distinguishing between healthy coral over here and dead coral that with algae on top. And so they're, they would be very interested in anybody as can figure out you know, different wavelengths or whatever to try to identify, uh, uh, help them clarify between the healthy coral and dead coral with algae. And so uh, this is an ex example of the uh, Allen Coral Atlas platform. Uh, and this next uh, uh, video is summarizes the uh, Allen Coral Atlas. It, yeah, this is the video that was used during the, the opening of the, the challenge and it actually is really a great summary. So uh, we're just gonna run this. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm overjoyed to share the Allen Coral Atlas, a new tool for coral conservation. Thanks Emmeline and Space Base for organizing the Space for the Planet Challenge. What a great way to ignite some new ideas. First, I'd like to highlight this has been a true team effort. This co-author list is just a subset of those working on the Atlas. I'm Brianna Bambic, a coral reef biologist by training and virtual reality producer as a National Geographic Explorer. Now I lead the field engagement team. And I'd first like to invite you to all explore allencoralatlas.org. To set the stage, our team has a few goals for today. We want to share the Allen Coral Atlas mapping and monitoring tools, so you have a basic understanding if you want to use them in your project. We also hope to connect with the space-based community, so you all have access to not only the Atlas platform, but also the training courses and resources we have freely available. And of course, we encourage all follow-ups and questions. The Atlas team started with two major challenges. As Charles Darwin discovered, mapping reefs is not as straightforward as observing and mapping land. And as coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse and threatened ecosystems on the planet, 
How are they still largely unmapped and unmonitored? And how are we supposed to protect what we don't know? So the Atlas is overcoming these challenges twofold by creating the world's first globally consistent map and dynamic monitoring system of the world's shallow coral reefs. It started with Planet Inc. and Andrew Zoli's fleet of over 150 Dove satellites pictured here. The central portion is about the size of a loaf of bread. These satellites can remotely sense the planet with high resolution imagery. Then Arizona State University's unique ability to essentially remove the seawater corrects for cloud, sun, and wave reflectance. We will use this satellite image of Heron Reef, Australia as an example. In the top left corner, you can make out the actual island and the surrounding reef. Here you can see an incredible level of detail. First the image, next the map. Here, University of Queensland's Remote Sensing Research Center uses field data collected by survey teams and existing data sets to generate the maps with object-based analysis and machine learning techniques. Each color represents a different benthic class. For example, microalgal maps, sand, and the coral algal combined layer down to a depth of 10 meters. The Atlas also provides the first ever globally consistent geomorphic map layer, condensing dozens of reef categories into 12 globally consistent geomorphic classes down to 15 meters. Next, the Atlas also includes a quarterly turbidity monitoring system by Arizona State University. This is a sample turbidity image since it is for download only and shows the highest level of turbidity per pixel for the quarter at 10 meter resolution. Curious minds could look into how land and sea interact around the world using this turbidity monitoring system. To show you the newest Atlas feature, which detects global coral bleaching, let's travel to a beautiful island in Indonesia. This archipelago was monitored July 5th of this year. As surface temperatures became warm, NOAA's Global Coral Reef Watch sends bleaching alerts as shown in yellow. So when a region signals a bleaching alert, the Atlas bleaching detection tool is initiated. Here, we are going to zoom into the north of the archipelago. You are able to see different bleaching severities across the islands, shown by low bleaching in yellow, moderate in orange, and severe in red. We are curious how you might use the Allen Coral Atlas bleaching detection tool. We hope these new marine technology tools spark some curiosity. And here are a couple more suggestions I have from working with researchers and conservationists worldwide. One need is identifying biodiverse areas that have multiple stressors to identify priority for conservation. Another potential use is identifying erosion and monitoring the surrounding area. How can you scale this up? Or how can you find patterns in coral health and connectivity? What IUCN red list species do we want to include in this monitoring effort? And how do we inform policy? Do we want to identify best practices by countries, potentially approaching marine spatial planning and conservation priorities? Up to you. This is a short introduction, and we have plenty of resources on the Atlas website and the YouTube channel, including this online course to keep your wheels spinning on how to use remote sensing and mapping for coral conservation. Here's a list of links for the online course resource. And we of course encourage all types of communication, especially in the virtual world. You can sign up for the newsletter to hear about new features, try out some of the tools and the data downloads. Please let us know how we can be of assistance. Reach us at these emails. And lastly, good luck everyone with the Space for Planet Earth Challenge. We would love to hear about your project or proposal that might integrate the Atlas. Please let us know so we can highlight your work. See you out there. Yeah, I just wanted to note that the, the video is actually on the website. So I know that there's a lot of links um, on that video and, and lots of resources. So uh, make sure to, to check it out on, on the video. So uh, the next part of the, the, the briefing is I just wanted to go and talk about the mechanics um, of actually participating in the challenge. Um, so uh, again, as Eric mentioned, there are two categories to, to the challenge. One is for high school and uh, one is for university. And uh, the high school is gonna focus on the coral health while university is gonna focus on carbon sequestration. 
the application requirements, uh, very simple. It's either you're a, uh, you're a high school or a university student, or if you're a startup, um, and for simplicity's simplicity sake, um, we actually define startup as like either a group or a company that has like less than or, or no more than 20 uh, employees. And then that you actually reside in New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. Uh, in terms of the prices, um, so there is a cash price uh, for the university startup for thirty thousand New Zealand dollars, and then for the high school uh, category, it's ten thousand, um, and then also an equivalent of fifteen thousand in data vouchers from Planet, as well as mentorship uh, from SpaceBase for six months. And in for the high school, uh, there's also a scholarship for the uh, the team up to six uh, uh, members to uh, participate in the US-based Mars Moon Virtual Astronautics Academy program. So um, uh, essentially what's gonna happen as part of the, the challenge is that we're running a virtual research incubator between November to January of uh, uh, 2022. And uh, the virtual incubator would uh, basically include like webinar sessions from design thinking to prototyping, um, and then access to specific satellite data uh, from uh, our partner planet, and then also mentorship. To be able to participate in the incubator, you basically need to submit a short proposal uh, of your idea, which is about two to 10 pages before um, uh, or at, uh, before the 31st of October, 2021. And the, uh, basically the, the proposal uh, has like several elements of which you, know, um, you have to uh, basically list who the team members are, um, what specific uh, area of the problem area you are going to be addressing, your technical approach, also an outline of your plan and your schedule. And then if you have any other specific, also ask for, for support. Um, in terms of the judging criteria, we're using the judging criteria for all of the stages of the, the, the challenge with, with uh, this rubric. So really the, the use of the space technology um, if, and then technology, technical feasibility. So is it science-based? Um, what's the innovative solution? Is it a new or an, an, a novel idea? Um, how are you implementing it? Uh, and then also the, um, we're also looking for maximum uh, environmental impact as well as uh, what state your prototype is gonna be at the end. Um, and then there's uh, also uh, additional points. If you, if you uh, show that there's gonna be some evidence of impact um, in, on the short term, uh, and then if you're collaborating with other stakeholders, as well as using other technologies, as well as, as, well as team composition. So the final selection process, um, uh, the final deadline for the application is really the 31st of January. Uh, and just to note that you can actually submit an application even though uh, you don't get selected into the incubator program or you don't participate in the incubator program. And the requirements really is just like a five minute video uh, demonstration of well, what you've done. Um, and then also a presentation deck of uh, what you're gonna be pitching. Uh, at the end of uh, the 31st of January, we're gonna be down selecting to three finalists from the high school level and then three finalists uh, from the university, uh, which will then um, we would invite uh, to participate in a demo and pitch session on the 18th of February here in Christchurch. So going back uh, full circle from what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're really looking for actionable um, outcomes uh, from, from the challenge, which could be either you know, contributing to already existing climate, uh, climate research initiatives um, in other kind of like institutions within the region, uh, but also uh, to incentivize uh, really carbon capture using biomass for either farmers or, or organizations or individuals. Uh, and then uh, to, would might be able to create new carbon credit schemes for uh, government and decision makers. Um, it could also specifically for the, the coral um, problem area, it could create area, area of uh, reserves, new, new reserves uh, for endangered regions. Um, and then also incentivizing citizen science for more ground truthing and also um, more uh, programs for, for sustainability uh, in the region.
And uh, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, the climate change problem is, can be overwhelming or, but uh, I think this is an opportunity to where we think that people that uh, attack this challenge may have a chance to really influence things on, on a global scale. And so uh, it's a very um, unique opportunity with this, the satellite data and the tools that are available now that you could really make a big difference um, if, and so what, that's what we're, we're looking for those people that will take this on as, and make a, a big difference in, in, in this global problem. Yeah, so before we go to the, the Q&A um, um, section, uh, I do want to introduce to you our guest speaker for today. So we talked about carbon credits um, in, in the presentation uh, in, in line uh, with what can potentially be done post-challenge, uh, in particular with, with carbon credits. Uh, our guest uh, researcher, uh, Yuri Anisimov, uh, is a researcher from... Um, from Wellington, and he's part of the, the Space Meetup Group, who will briefly talk about how blockchain uh, is currently being leveraged uh, for carbon accounting and, and mitigation. So uh, just to introduce Yuri, Yuri um, is a technology expert in traditional and innovative financial technologies. Uh, Yuri is currently leading a, a project building crypto environmental economics in agriculture. Uh, in the past, uh, Yuri worked with Catalyze, a global venture company, and founded and managed a company in Singapore offering financial market and volatility forecasting tools. Uh, before starting his own consulting uh, business, uh, Yuri worked with the Hewitt Packard Enterprise in Singapore, Malaysia, and Japan. Uh, he headed regional technology engineering services and trading infrastructure at uh, West Deutsch uh, Land Bank in Asia and also worked at Sevklov's Mathematical Institute in St. Petersburg uh, in Russia. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna give Yuri the floor. Uh, thanks, Evelyn. Just give me one second. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Yes, yes. Uh, your slides is just coming up. In the, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so I'll try to be really quick. Um, the, um, uh, what we're talking about is basically uh, we are addressing not the actual, um, not the actual, um, uh, remediating efforts, but rather the measuring, measuring and analytics for this. So there are two major approaches, how to control emissions, uh, greenhouse emissions. It is a market approach of green taxes. Green tax is one of the variety of policy measures. And as um, you know, they, they are not without fault. And everyone who is familiar with, say, Austrian economics saying that any centralized governance policies are making things only worth. Uh, so another approach is carbon trade, which originated with Kyoto Protocol in 2005, which is um, works with a market-based system, which works more or less um, simple principle. Uh, every country or individuals or individual participating or company being uh, given some allowance on um, emitting certain amount of carbon dioxide. And um, once it's, um, if it's not, the limit is not used, they can uh, sell the reminder on, on open market and the companies who need to use more, uh, ish, emit more, they can actually buy this. So that's, um, quite a simple approach. And there are a few programs that exist. One of the most familiar to people are mandatory programs that are uh, usually based on international standards. And there are numerous dispersed programs, sometimes incompatible. In fact, there are many markets, not a single market and credits you buy in one market can not be solved often on other markets low liquidity instruments, high transaction costs. Um, also, there are um, 
are mostly country-based voluntary programs. Uh, it's isolated systems under, once again, region centralized government, uh, regulations, high transaction costs, non-fungible instruments. And uh, recently, there are quite a few solutions trying to use distributed uh, ledger technology to solve the issues of fraud, double counting of assets, and they provide a lot of uh, interesting features. One of, um, I will try to summarize the market solution requirements for this sort of distributed ledgers. First of all, uh, we need to have a trusted uh, data collection automated based on real time remote sensors or signed, um, uh, signed measurements if we're using, for example, satellite imagery. The data needs to be stored properly. It should be immutable data storage uh, with a privacy concern. And once again, it's coming from digital design, coming from trusted sources. Then it's very important to have a proper model of interaction of market participants, model to allocate resources efficiently with a fair distribution of public good. Uh, and then finally, market participants should agree on distribution of liabilities and the conditions to enforce the liabilities. Two uh, small additions are safeguards, usually for these carbon trading schemes, uh, the Dutch auction uh, schemes, are, schemes are being used with the reserve minimum price that uh, basically allows you to eliminate the market failure and very important for a model of interaction or model of uh, uh, allocation of resources to work for is a low to negligible transaction cost. So blockchain works well in this condition. And uh, um, one of the, our partners had a solution that was coined in 2017 called DAO IPCI, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization for integral plat as an integral platform climate initiatives. Um, recent development has been based on another open source project called Robonomics Networks. And I'm going to address it a little bit later. Here's the diagram of how uh, DAO IPCI works. It's uh, it unites um, by decentralized autonomous organization, it unites uh, major stakeholders, basically four issues, operators, auditors, and users. And they connect them to the centralized and decentralized registries. The technology ensures transparency and the possibility of global interaction with carbon markets and remediators. It's based on a few. Um, on a few components. One of them is a model of social enterprise. Um, a Nobel Prize winner, Lean Ostrom, formulated a design principle for how economic cooperation can succeed on the basis of self-governing organizations, a community-based enterprises. And uh, I've just listed here, and I'm going to share the slides later on, uh, the how her principles are being mapped into smart contracts on blockchain, which is uh, gives us direct way of uh, building up smart contracts for social enterprise, for economic operations. The quantifying of social cost usually is done on based on cost theorem, another Nobel Prize winner. The uh, important requirement of cost theorem applicability is that the transaction cost should be zero or negligible, which blockchain works very well in here. I uh, So basically that's uh, uh, token emission is, um, works as the as equivalent of allowance that's um, being used in uh, mandatory programs. And one very important, our friends are developing a RoboVix networks, which is the industry 4.0 type of interface or protocol for robot to human interaction. Allows to uh, subscribe to 
um, the readings from different type of remote sensors in the uh, economy of robots or uh, providing concept of robot of service, which uh, allow you to basically have the network of sensors uh, measuring information. And these measurements are being recorded into distributed file system called interplanetary file system. And uh, all those interplanetary file system data are uh, being hashed has been computed, being recorded in the, private, uh, in the public blockchain can be used for different applications. So the originally, the system was based on Ethereum ERC20 tokens, uh, which have a rather high gas value. Now people are experimenting with Polkadot side chains, which has practically much lower gas requirements. Um, using the lightweight, uh, subscription messaging protocol and dropping a uh, robot operating system to operate. Importantly, it's using uh, using digital twins of devices, which is like a very cool feature. And uh, Robonomics allows to build up an open sense network, uh, make a, a sensor network with data subscription mechanism and create an um, IoT marketplace. So basically the advantage of this solution uh, that they are all free open source. People are invited to participate. Uh, here I listed a few links. And, um, and uh, well, we're working in a, on a platform that extending this sort of um, approach for other polluting factors for applications in expert economy in agricultural logistics in particular. But uh, if, I, uh, if I have a minute, I would rather display, um, display interesting demonstration that was created during recent hackathon in, um, on the Robonomics. Uh, this, uh, which is demonstrating the use of um, remote sensors built on Mars or Moon. Do I have time for this? Yeah, go ahead, Yuri. Okay, let me stop sharing this. I'll share another one. So it starts very slowly. So we're assuming there's no sound. Oh, there is no sound? Sorry. It's probably sound is not being translated properly. I'm going to share the, um, the link and then everyone can have a look at this one. The Kusama is one of the, um, Kusama is one of the parachain protocols used in uh, Polkadot environments and Polkadot, uh, Polkadot chain of um, uh, distributed ledger contracts. All right, thank you. Thanks, Yuri. Um, let me just uh, get my view to gallery here. All right, um, so I think we have 15 minutes left from the, the, the session. And um, if people have any questions, you can either put it on the, the chat or also uh, you can also just basically um, unmute. Uh, unmute and ask the question. Just a question about um, planet 
um, access? Is it different to the free trial? So the, the planet access is gonna be very similar to the, the basic university researcher um, uh, like category. So, yeah, because they have several free trials in my understanding. So I, I'm not quite sure exactly which one uh, you had mentioned, um, but but certainly it's gonna be similar to the university and, and student, uh, but we have uh, extra basically um, uh, sort of uh, support from them with like uh, actual training for the challenge uh, itself and then uh, people from planet. Will we get access to that um, as part of the challenge, or is that only once you're incubated after afterwards? That's uh, you'll have uh, access to it during the incubator if you actually um, are selected for the the incubator. Yeah, and but if you're if you have a, some other connection through a, a university or right. something like that, you can. Uh, get access to similar data without going through the incubator. Cool, thank you. Let's see, can you get a copy of the slides? Yes, definitely. Um, what, what I normally do is I, I will also post uh, the video uh, on the website um, and then a uh, good point with the slides, I, I, sh I definitely uh, should be able to do that. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. For those who might be wanting to contribute or participate in the challenge, um, a question is how are people networking to discover each other? If, yeah. if there's a, you know, what, what sort of networks are there? Good question. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the, the challenge or the incubator, for sure, we normally do have like an internal um, uh, way, you know, and we, and we haven't decided yet, maybe it could be a Slack uh, uh, channel or, or not. But um, we also, um, we, we can also create um, a, a, another way for just regular people who are still trying to decide um, so that can be done um, either we can add it to the, the website or we can also do it something like, you know, uh, for example, a, a LinkedIn group um, as well. Yeah, maybe a LinkedIn group would be would good. Be an, yeah, yeah. Yeah, an easy way yeah. to do. So, uh, and, and so people who signed up for this, we can uh, uh, send you a message uh, when we have something like that set up. But, but yeah, thanks for reminding us yeah, we need to those do are, that. Uh, those are good, uh, definitely, uh, things that we, we need to add. Any other questions? I'm just like looking at the, the chat here. How many people are typically in a group? Um, uh, just from experience from the last uh, challenges, uh, we've had ones where there's just two people in a group um, or uh, there's also ones where like in, in, in one of the high school um, teams, there was at least six, six of them uh, kind of like in a group. So uh, it varies and uh, we're, we're pretty flexible. Yeah, there's no restraints, so it could be one person or it could be a dozen. So. We just well, want to make sure that the uh, whoever is the principal um, person who's actually applying, that person needs to be a, a resident of um, New Zealand, Australia, or, or the Pacific Islands. Yeah, because there was one, uh, there was one recommendation as well that uh, maybe uh, um, you know, teams could also combine. So for example, if there is a team in New Zealand that might be interested in uh, potentially, uh, uh, you know, collaborating with uh, say at, uh, some individuals or, or teams in the Pacific, so because in the Pacific, 
um, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically for the, the coral um, reef uh, uh, problem, where there is a lot more uh, options for ground validation um, with if you like connect with individuals in, in the Pacific. So that's another, just uh, an example of what could be done. And I think, uh, yeah, the question about uh, connecting people you know, for, for building teams, I, I think we do need that. Uh, I think LinkedIn group is. Uh, is, is certainly is, some, is it's a mechanism for, mechanism. for doing that. Um, how, how, yeah, uh, basically we, you don't need to do the solution in the proposal. You can just yeah. say, um, sort of like a, a subset of the of the problem that you're uh, identifying to work on and a general approach you know of you know what you think you're going to analyze data from it with the satellite data and you think you might learn you know uh, a certain direction so you can it, it's just a it's mainly to say that you're serious about uh addressing these issues and uh, and just sort of confident that you're actually you know addressing the problem and, and not yeah because the premise really is that uh, the, the the incubator the research incubator is going to help you uh, go through your goal uh, so certainly uh, yeah the proposal is is really a proposal of what you want to do uh, but not the not necessarily the solution. And you can change your mind once you're yeah. in, you know, and uh, uh, change your approach. Uh, the final uh, solution is not until I mean, the uh, the demonstration of what you uh, figured out is not due until uh, January next year. You want to take this? Um, come up with ideas and create that. How we find it? What is data is available? Yeah. So we have. Um, uh, uh, that we're going to try to keep, keep adding to the links and resources uh, to give you clues about this, but it's but a lot of it is up to you to investigate. So it's um, the uh, uh, so we have the um, the the planet data is going to be uh, basically five thousand square kilometers in that you can access through their. Um, archive and but the uh, the all the different uh, free data from like Sentinel two or Landsat or things like that um, they, we can just give you clues about you know, what kind of uh, satellite systems are out there and that these things are uh, freely accessible from either the U.S. government or from the European Union and uh, but it it's uh, all we can do is sort of give clues about uh, links that are useful, things like that. Um, so it's uh, yeah. So we are gathering those, um, and uh, we're hoping to put them on the website. You know, even before the deadline for to the proposal um, that should be. Um, so, so so yeah, that's certainly something that uh, uh, would be uh, putting in on the resources. Uh, let's see. Let's see, there was one before this, right? Okay. Yeah, okay, the question is uh, something like a sensitivity study on how to apply the satellite tools available and how the analysis can be used to improve carbon inventory solutions. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, that's sort of a, um, a statement of the carbon sequestration problem. It, part of this is um, that, you know, like, uh, uh, with the forest, you can actually map the boundaries of the of the forest if you know what it is. But how do you, if you look at you know uh, native bush, how do you know what you're looking at, and how how do you get an estimate of of how much carbon is being sequestered in that region? And so uh, there's uh, you either go from the the simple ones where you know what you're looking at to the more and more complicated ones where you're not sure what you're seeing and, and how much carbon is being sequestered. So you can you can pick and choose you know what what area you want to uh, attack uh, in that aspect of the problem. Um, and so it's uh, but yeah it's a, a big part of it is just trying to to improve the uh, uh, in carbon inventory. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. 
uh, proposal is just how would we act against climate change for a game plan? Um, it's it's not it's uh, we're we're picking uh, the specific language of those problem statements um, to deal with certain aspects. We we looked at sixteen different options about you know, addressing related to climate change, but we we were picking, for example, the carbon sequestration because uh, there's we think the satellite data has an opportunity to get more quantitative information about these different land use types and how much it being carbon is being sequestered. So that's one side. And the other side is on the coral health is trying to start from the Allen Coral Atlas and, and improve it, address some of the problems that the Atlas is having uh, and, uh, and help understand the interactions of the, uh, the coral health with all the other environmental effects for, uh, for these islands. Um, and so uh, the, those are, we try to keep the problem statement broad enough that you could approach different aspects of the problem, uh, but also narrow enough that we're sort of giving you directions that there's two aspects, the carbon sequestration and the coral health. Um, we're not talking about general climate uh, uh, mitigation or, or uh, other, other factors. So, but, but just to, to, to reiterate on the game plan, it, I mean, it is definitely a game plan for the specific problem um, area. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically, if you, if you can do something with monitoring of uh, and giving uh, people credit for the card in these different land use types, um, there's like, just like uh, Yuri laid out a, uh, a, a framework of how this might be used in the future uh, for carbon trading. Uh, there's also, I just read that there was, you know, $60 billion of investment in this area uh, around the world. And so it's, um, it looked, it, you could uh, develop, that's why we, we include startups. We could include, potentially include a tool that is really right at the center of, of people's carbon, uh, of climate mitigation strategies. And so uh, there's a huge opportunity to influence the, the health of the whole planet here um, and put yourself in the middle of that. Great. Um, I think we have two minutes left. Uh, is there anybody else who have any questions? Oh, Yuri already shared his slides. Okay. Oh, Good. great. Oh, here's a question about whether or not you use the the values for the different uh, species. I would say, you know. If you uh, if you come up with better uh, or if you identify better data and uh, a better validation of of what carbon is being sequestered in different species, that's that's a big step forward. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I just uh, I collected some of those numbers from all sorts of different sources, and uh, some of them are really uncertain. And so, uh, uh, if you can uh, improve those numbers, you know, please do. Uh, great all right well um i think we've, we're out of time uh again thank you so much uh everyone for for attending um and if you ha do have any questions for us about the challenge uh just like send us an email it's uh info at um uh, spaceforearth.org or challenge at spaceforearth.org. Um, and um, yeah, we'll we'll uh, keep on adding information as well on the website. And there's a lot of um, really great uh, recommendations for how to communicate as well. And, and then also uh, collaborate or, or maybe network um, with the people that uh, might want to participate. So we really appreciate uh, your time and uh, uh, thanks so, so much and have a great evening.